it's going to change everything. For 400 years since Linnaeus, we've just been euthanizing things as soon as we find them. And that was fine back then. But when we have all this critically endangered stuff that we need to record and get information about, then we can we can now go out and I can find this thing. You know, Zuckerberg, we, we haven't seen it forever. We don't know if it's the last one. And so we go out and we find it. We can put it on this contraption and we can take a 3D scanner and assemble it. And I can throw it out into the cloud. This guy can assemble it. And we can deposit it as a digital specimen from the field. We don't have to kill anything. We don't have to leave the field. It's just there. And then we can actually do all that. Everybody in the world, kids in classrooms around the world can just see that instantly. and put the VR goggles on. They can like make money or whatever. And then after we scan it, it's not invasive. We take the DNA sample from it. We can do, we can do, we can extract that tank gun that content if we wanted to. We're, we're planning on strapping these transmitters on there, this new type of telemetry device that we can put on them. And then we can just monitor what we can actually learn what they're doing, their ecology, but they're, where they're behaving, like, like, what, like what part of the canopy they're spending most of the time on, what, what kind of trees are they using, that kind of stuff. Instead of just putting and you know, having it sit in a jar somewhere, like we learn all this other, other data by re- releasing it and then and having been able to share everywhere. Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. I have an incredibly fascinating episode for you. Today, I'm speaking with Scott Tregesser, who is the executive director of the Biodiversity Group. The Biodiversity Group is focused on protecting life overlooked. Now, as herpeticulturalists, we are constantly working with the animals that are overlooked, reptiles, amphibians, and inverts. So this is right in our wheelhouse. This is an incredibly fascinating conversation, and I'll say right off the top, a few weeks ago, I released that episode, maybe a couple months ago now, about th- that solo episode where I just discussed the ethics of herpeticulture. And one of the proposals that I raised in that episode is that as herpeticulturalists, we ought to be supporting conservation when we can. I'm not saying you need to donate your entire salary to conservation groups, but I'm saying as reptile keepers, as people who are keeping animals in, in captivity, I think it is crucial that we're also supporting conservation in some capacity. And this episode gives you an incredible opportunity to do that with this just fascinating project. So in the episode, we discussed the biodiversity group, how Scott got involved in it. They actually have a, a, a program within their group that is dedicated to finding and rediscovering new species of animals. And they've discovered a bunch of d- different species of frogs and even some snakes. And Scott walks us through what that is like. What is it like when you actually find something that's not been described before? What are the steps scientifically that need to take place in order to do that, naming the species and so on and so on. So that part of the conversation was incredibly fascinating. Now, the second half of this conversation revolves around the Zoog's monitor lizard, which is a species of monitor lizard that was discovered back in the 1980s. But the interesting Well, there's several interesting things about this species. The first is that only one specimen has ever been recovered from the wild in Halmahara in Indonesia. And the first 25 years of its discovery, it was actually mislabeled in the museum as a specimen as a tree monitor. In the early 2000s, that was corrected and they realized that this is actually a new species. Hence, the the Zug monitor was named. Now, Scott and the team at the Biodiversity Group have good reason to believe that there are still wild populations of this animal on the islands in Indonesia, and they have that expedition planned out using some of the most fascinating technology I've ever heard of when it comes to looking for animals. One of them is this contraption that will use a drone to fly through the rainforest and actually suck up air into it and into a, into basically a parcel. And then they can use that air and sequence the DNA in that air parcel and determine whether or not the lizard or the Zoog's monitored lizard had been around that area in the last you know, 24 hours or so. That was just one of the things that we talked about in this episode as far as technology goes. There is some serious implications, positive implications that will happen in the the world of conservation if this project is able to move forward and i want to make sure that it's very clear to the listeners that this is an opportunity for everyone to participate in this by helping this project by funding this project i'm not asking for people to donate hundreds of dollars or half their paycheck or anything like that if you can donate five or ten dollars this is that moment that we've all been waiting for as far as showing that reptile keepers can be very responsible and we are someone who's focused on conservation and we want these projects to move forward and we're happy to move our dollar to an area where we know it's going to be used to help protect the wildlife on the planet and again 
not everybody's in the position to, you know, f- fund certain things or make a donation. And I'm not, I don't want anyone to make a donation if they, if they don't have the resources to do so. But if you are somebody who has some extra cash laying around or you have five or $20 or whatever it is, this is an opportunity to, to help an incredible project. And the, the cascading effect of making sure this project move forward is incredible. And we'll, we'll get into that at the end of this episode. So everything to do with the link donations or the donation links and, and whatnot will be in the YouTube description as well as the show notes. And again, so many people came to me after that one solo episode I did where I talked about conservation and they were saying, I want to get involved. This is one way you can get involved. And I really do hope we can get a bunch of the Animals at Home listeners to help make a donation. We really want to bump them into that $10,000 range, which they're already so close. We don't need much support to hit that $10,000. And we want to make sure that this project moves forward because it's so incredibly fascinating. Before we jump into it, if you are looking for more information on this episode, including the links to donate, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. The show notes are there. Thank you so much to all the Patreon supporters that you guys are really making this show happen. Without you, I would not be able to do this show. I do pay an editor $500 a month to make sure these shows get edited. And without the Patreon support, I just wouldn't be able to do that. I don't have time to edit the show anymore. This is not my full-time job. I do have a full-time job. So this the, the recording the episode kind of gets you know, put between my regular work day and I just wouldn't have time to edit. So Patreon does make that happen. If you're looking for a shirt or sweater, make sure you head to animalsathome.ca slash shop. Of course, $5 is automatically donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. And thank you so much to Custom Reptile Habitats, the sponsor of the podcast. If you're looking for any new enclosures, you can find an affiliate link in both the YouTube description and the show notes. Let's jump into this episode. Enjoy. All right. Well, Scott, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks, Will. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm super excited to have this conversation. I saw, I think, is it Noah's uh, N F N F K N K F? I always forget. I want to say N F K, but it's always N K F. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, NKF. Yeah, that's right. Because I think his last name is Fields. Anyway, and people are very familiar with NKF herping, and uh, he had a little clip on on Instagram about the project that you're working on, which brought it to my attention. And it was one of those videos where, as I was watching, I was just like it was opening up all these other questions for me. Like, I want to, I want to ask about that. I want to ask about that. So we will get into this incredible project that you're, you're um, trying to put together here, but I'm curious about your background because it seems like you kind of have an interesting background and you're a young guy and you have this, this amazing conservation that you're working with. So, so tell me how you got into what you're doing now. What's, what's your background in education and interest wise? Yeah, so it's like all conservationists kind of have this, at least of, of my age and, and older, it's the traditional, non-traditional path. Like we, there was no real route into conservation that was well traveled, you know, everybody found their way in through this kind of haphazardly. I, with one of these cases, like probably a lot of your listeners would just loved bugs and reptiles when I was young and just kind of stuck with it, you know, and it was, yeah, I think a lot of us would stick with it, but then there was no funding, like there was no, the salaries were really low, the, job opportunities weren't really there. So I just kind of persisted through that. I got lucky. I had some friends that ended up like I went for a PhD in genetic engineering, essentially, but um, <laughs> it didn't really um didn't really play out. I, I quit two years in for a consulting job and it gave me money and free time. So then I kind of just found purpose after that. And there was like a whole route going into through Bangladesh or in the nonprofit over there in like 2013. And then like that was with a lot of species specific stuff with Burmese pythons. And I don't know if you have any experience with them. What got pushed you to, to start with the like go to Bangladesh and start working with, you know, a, a conservation yeah, or was that something I, that you had started or. Yeah. So it's like, so I had these jobs. I, I went in, I wanted to be an, an entomological systemicist for a long time when I was a kid. I just want to go out and look for bugs, finding species. I went okay. and talked to like a famous guy, Carl Olson at the university of Arizona where I went my undergrad. And like after freshman, freshman year and he, I was, like, oh, I was all excited to talk to him. It's like, yeah, I'm going to like get in with this. As soon as I talked to him, he's like, yeah, d- don't do that. That's a bad idea. Don't, there's like no job. Like, what? Floored. Um, and then I went through a bunch of different majors. Well, it was the same major, but like different uh, emphasis. And I ended up with like genetics because it was interesting. It was tough. Like there was some purpose in it. And then I hated being inside, man. Like I just couldn't be inside that long. And there were, it was like a monsoon season in Southeast Arizona. And I'd be inside doing like alignments and stuff. I'm like, man, I really wish I would just go out to find the species right now or whatever. So, so then I, I got into these consulting jobs, which I, I go and survey for desert tortoises on military bases a lot. And some of them are just like actual construction monitoring. So I have a lot of, they pay 
like more than you think they should and but then it gives me yeah yeah too. so really perfect it's like the best job a biologist can have but you have no purpose like a lot of these, like the data doesn't really go anywhere a lot of the time it's uh a lot of times the crews would kind of do what you would do without them without you being there anyways so i was searching for purpose a buddy of mine knew this guy from bangladesh i hooked up with him i went out and he did like the he, he, we were both young same age uh this guy had been to the united states before he was bangladeshi and I went out to be the, um, the surgical implantation specialist. Like I was, I was actually putting in the transmitters and the snakes. I'd only seen it done twice, man. Like I went out there and, but because, and this is going to be the theme because I was white and American, they were just like, sure, pass, go ahead. You can do it. And, mm. uh, and so we did a great job, right? Like I, I knew what I was doing, but I was by no means an expert. And that's kind of a theme too. You just kind of jump into things and it kind of it plays out. And so that evolved, like that program went really well. We published on it. It was, we were really, at the time, like pretty much the only people working on Burmese pythons in the wild, uh, really fun stuff, lots of stories there. But, uh, then it evolved into, well, is this really helping with conservation? We know we're getting like this spatial ecology data, we can be able to like biology data, but like, is it really helping? And because they were still just getting killed and everything else. So we evolved mostly Caesar push range this, this realm of doing actual conservation work. We went to the Southeast in that country, worked with the indigenous, started making indigenous community conservation areas. We started breeding tortoises that were critically endangered, basically functionally extinct in that area. And then we ended up just last year, kind of came to fruition. We reintroduced those tortoises for the first time, next species ever back in the wild, which is rad. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that, a lot of it, you know, was me going out and making sure Caesar could, Caesar Rahman, the guy, uh, the CEO of Creative Conservation Alliance, and uh, make sure he had the resources he needed to do his job. And so I was, you know, I'd be like, okay, this is what we do. This is what I think we do. This is the science that I know. And what, how do you apply that in a culturally appropriate context, right? And then that worked out right. well. And I was able to find funding for him, links that, for international networks and stuff that really kept it going. And eventually, man, I got I got kicked out of the country, essentially. Like, I for this ridiculous stuff about pangolins. They thought I was stealing the patent rights to pangolin. I was doing this genetic. Study. It was like the most altruistic study I'd ever done. I was giving all this stuff away, and they were still like, "Nah, you're doing some shady." So, <laughs> long, long stories and things that I probably shouldn't say out on in public. But so the uh, bottom line was, I came back kind of disheartened in like 2019, and I was like, "Oh, what am I going to do? Like, I can't really go back there." And then uh, at the same time, this guy Paul Hamilton, who was running Biodiversity Group, which is what I now run, he was burnt out hard, like we all kind of get in this conservation realm, and. Uh, so he, he knew me, I had been working with him. He kind of got me started on conservation science stuff and expeditions. And uh, I just took it over and I you know, I restructured it and made it so it was financially sustainable. And really, it's been taken off, as you can see, with this this new project. It's like, it's everything I ever wanted in a, <laughs> in a project. Yeah, yeah, it does sound perfect. So so you basically stepped in for him. He was able to hand it over to you to someone he's obviously comfortable with taking, you know, taking the torch and he was able to step back. And then you know, was there a, a point in time where like, as far as your salary or funding, was there, was there a big gap or did you, were you able to, you know, get, get yourself financially stable in that new role at biodiversity group relatively soon? So luckily I have an amazing staff that volunteered for quite a while for us that they were also really, they had the passion and they were committed to the mission. Uh, this is like Ross Maynard, he's our director of research and Natalie all his wife, who's doing all our art. And then several other volunteers that have helped with other projects. And I've been volunteering the whole time too. So this is kind of a good passion project. And it's, you know, we could get paid. I'm paying some staff now, but I'll be last to get paid if we ever get to that point. But because I'm privileged to be able to have these other jobs where I just like worked seven months straight on these jobs, but I can do conservation work while on that job, which is mm. not ideal, but it makes it work. So we can still move through. I still develop all this stuff that you're seeing now. So it, it works out and it's a lot of sacrifice, like a, a lot of sacrifice and, uh, but it, it keeps it going and hopefully there's a sustainable point which we can actually get paid, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I got you. So you're still doing the environmental consulting or the consulting with uh, as a biologist. Okay, that makes sense. And th that actually works out well because then you can still get a good paycheck but then still work on your passion. And at least the the, the day job is not uh, totally outside the realm of your interest. It's not like you're entering data into spreadsheets or something and, and it has nothing to do with animals. At least you're on site somewhere. Yeah, I'm in the field. I'm in, I've limited out of a Tacoma that I modded out and it's just hanging out with tortoises or whatever. So I can, I can focus, I can get on my laptop at night and do stuff. And 
And, but I, I have cool. like 10 side gigs we counted the other day. It's just ridiculous to try to make this life work. Um, and I have yeah. a supportive girlfriend that makes it so I can bum around doing this conservation stuff. That's awesome. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about the biodiversity group. Maybe kind of what, what its mission and goals are. Just maybe flesh it out for people who are unfamiliar with, with what it is. Right. So we're, we like to say, we protect life overlooked. So there's a lot of, a lot of what we all, like your listeners, care a lot about. The reptiles, amphibians, we do fungus, uh, you know, invertebrates, anything that really, and mammals and birds too, depending on the species in place. There's a lot of areas around the world that aren't getting the attention they need and a lot of species that aren't getting the attention they need. And so what we're trying to do is I kind of, back, going back to the uh, Bangladesh pro- projects, I leverage my ability to get these resources and these networks and everything to um, make make all these links and make it so these conservation organizations that work on these other species that most people don't care about, it's hard to get funding for, hard to get attention for. Make sure they have the, the the funding and the resources that they need. So we'll go into that. We have programs where we just give out a lot of stuff to these these organizations that it's like they need. I know they need because I've been in that situation creating a small nonprofit before. And so now it's because I don't have an in country program a lot of the time. Like we don't specifically work only in one country. Then I have a lot of time to move around and make connections for everybody. And it makes this great synergy for this alliance that we've built. So essentially. We go out and the most exciting part of it is going out on these expeditions. You go and discover new species in remote areas like this place. If your listeners are watching this, this is uh, the Rio Mandura, Rio Mandura Aqua Reserve. Sorry, I'm from Australia, um, in Ecuador. And it's this beautiful area that hasn't been touched in like 400 years. It's a private reserve. And we've rediscovered several species there I hadn't seen in several decades and uh, new species. And it's been a real, there's been a lot of conservation of wings here. We're in a giant gold mine. Uh, there's been illegal loggers. We've, been, we've expanded the reserve in, in conjunction with these uh, the land managers and everything else. It's just a big alliance that we make a lot of good things happen with. We do that around the world. And so we have a fiscal sponsorship that we go through, which is kind of technical, and it basically just lets them route money through the U.S., and that helps them in a lot of ways. Um, but we have these other programs where if you have like conservation gear or field guides or whatever, you can just donate to us and we make sure they get to the right places. And so like all this little stuff we kind of pick up that isn't economical for most organizations, but because we don't have, uh, we're not really going out there looking for money. So we can just, uh, give these things that are important, but not, they don't give any return to us financially. Yeah, yeah, it's almost like the logistics side. Like, some you need somebody to move all those pieces and and to make sure that the equipment gets into the right spots. And yeah, that that makes sense. So, as, you know, you'd mentioned the rediscoveries and the discovery of species. Is that something that was always a you know a staple of the biodiversity group, or is that something that you guys kind of stumbled into at some point while you were working on a project? That's really where it kind of started with Paul and and Ross Maynard and a couple other guys. They, they went out and did scientific expeditions. So they go out and they provide, they record very tedious data about where the animal is located at night. We do, we, you take enough of this data, you go out every night, and you're surveying these areas, and then you can give those land managers data on like, oh, this is the species richness, this is how dense the populations are, this is what we need to look at. And then we can get stuff listed on ICN or different protections um, and try to give them more funding too. Because like a lot of this Rio Mandura Reserve, it helps them get money when we're like, hey, this has, this preserve has four species found nowhere else in the world. And mm-hmm. it had, they hadn't even known to be ex- in existence anymore. So then people that are given funding, like, okay, well, this place actually needs to get preserved. Like there's, there's no doubt about it. So we did, did that for a lot of countries and they would, but in, in the end, it was kind of an academic program wrapped in a nonprofit shell and it wasn't sustainable. That's why he burnt out. Uh, he was doing great work, but it just wasn't, the, the money wasn't coming in. So I needed to do this fiscal sponsorship program or um, a bunch of other things that we can, that were more attractive for like, sustainability. And then we can still stay true to our roots and going out and doing all this fun, like bleeding edge conservation expedition stuff. Yeah, that sounds amazing. So, so tell me a little bit about, you know, finding some, some species. You guys have a, actually quite a little rap sheet on the, on the website of different species that you've either discovered or rediscovered. When you go into an area, are you, is there like a list of things that you know should be here and haven't been seen in a while? Or, I mean, obviously if you're discovering species, you can't go in with the intention to discover something. So maybe you could tell us, a, a, you know, a few of the stories about finding and re- refinding certain things. Yeah. A lot of times, you know, you, you'll go into an area and you can't expect like that. Okay. I'm going to rediscover this because we don't, a lot of times 
a lot of times you'll have like a, a record of a species and it's 200 kilometers away and it's maybe the record was wrong in locality or something. And so it's this big mystery. It's the world's biggest treasure hunt. Like you saw the stuff missing. It's active. It's moving around. It knows how to hide. And you're out there and just like a foreigner in this, in this forest trying to find this thing that's a native and knows everything about it. So, uh, it's a great challenge. And when we go out and you, you end up finding something and you just, you stumble upon it. Like one of the Googler shadow snake was one that the latest one that we rediscovered. I hadn't been seen 54 years. I walk out on the last night of, of an expedition and just alone because we were doing all, everyone's packing up here, right? It's the last night. And for whatever reason, last night's on an expedition, you always find something epically cool and you have no time to do anything with it. And so I go out and I find this thing. It looked like a ninius like snake. It's just a small kind of indescript black snake, but it didn't have a nuchal band. And we're like, all right, well, shit, what is this worthwhile? Like, we don't even know. Like, it's this, this Amocleophis genus that is in it's like, wasn't even very well known to us. We take, I, we're looking at it. I take it back. I'm like, okay, this kind of looks different. Might, might be worthwhile. And Ross Maynard's, uh, my research director, he knows a lot more about the species down there. He's like an encyclopedia on it. He's like, yeah, man, I, it's like tough because you got to make this call. You got to be like, okay, well, is it, is it cool enough that we have to euthanize it? Which is this irony. But, uh, in order to learn about it, and we'll actually touch on that a little later, that, you, yeah, you have to kill things to be able to study them a lot. We ended up releasing it. We're like, man, it's just like, we think it's just a, like a morph of this, of this ninja. And then it turns out, like, we looked at the photos and Jaime, Jaime Culebras, like, looked at it later and he kind of pointed out these papers and maybe it's this. And then Ross was like, oh, fuck, yeah, it, it, we shouldn't have let that thing go and we have to go back and find it again. And then, like, it's just comes back and forth. And so sometimes it happens like that. Sometimes. Did you I, try to go find the same, that specimen? Yeah. <laughs> well, not the exact individual, right? But we knew where it oh, was. Okay. So it was a, enough, there was enough time between where you're, you know, you just go hunt in that area for the, for another one. Yeah. And I like the stream side at this time of night and it rained this like X, X hours beforehand. Like we had all this data. So it's, we ended up finding it again and we, and we publish on it and it's, and then it's in the bag. Um, that's added to the species list for that, um, conservation manager. And other ones, like I had a, a frog, the world, it's the world's most beautiful glass frog, Indo glass frog. Um, it's subjective, but I think it was. And uh, I was ridden with parasites. I was just wrecked on this one expedition. I was like jaundiced and just hating life. I didn't want to just take naps in the mud at midnight because we were out. And I'm like, should I just need a nap? <laughs> it's like something's wrong. So the next night, everyone's out doing doing the thing, and I'm like, I'm just going to go watch behavior of this other thing that we had redis- that a different group had rediscovered as Rainbow Lalai Toad. It's like nobody, we, we don't know anything about it. And really all I wanted to do in life is watch animals do animal things and figure out what, mm-hmm. what the language is, you know? And, uh, so I'm looking and they, I'm going up these waterfalls to go to observe this thing. And I hear this call. I'm like, okay, I don't recognize what this is. And then I find it. And I look at it. I'm like, okay, well, this is different. This is special. Uh, I don't exactly know what it is because we weren't, it wasn't on our radar to find that. So I went up and I spent all night in the jungle that night. I was like just sitting in front of a leaf watching this toad. The toad didn't do anything the whole night. It was it was incredible how still it was. And then at six fifteen in the morning, like I'm waiting. It's like oh it's sunrise. Like it's going to do something. And then this this whole like swarm of mosquitoes came and attacked me out of the underbrush, just a massive like at once. And so I kind of swam away. And then I look back at the toad and it's gone. I'm like well where's that? And then and I'm feeling like crap. So <laughs> it's, it's like that was all for nothing. I was like oh yeah, I have to have this frog still. And I go back and I sleep until like eleven. So I wake up and I throw it on a guy. And I'm like hey check this out. And you're like. Ah, oh, bitch about the fire. It's where did he found this? Like it's and there's this amazing rediscovery. And it's like I honestly didn't even know I knew it was different. I knew it was special, but I didn't know exactly what it was. So sometimes and that's not always how it goes, but these are the fun times where it's like you find you're like, okay, do I want to psych myself out? Is it really new? And is it really this special? And you're like, no, I don't get the hope that it is it's this roller coaster is great. So so what happens when you when you actually discover something new? Like what's the procedure there? Well, you usually take, you euthanize a specimen. You, you, you take all the data that you found, like observationally. You want to take, you want to make sure you, you record the color that it is in situ, like where in place, where it is. So, cause that color changes and even texture in frogs change. Sometimes they, it actually describes frogs based on like the texture that they had after capture, which lacked tubercles, but then in, or maybe had tubercles, but then the wild, like you didn't expect that like skin texture to change. So it's really important to understand that what it looks like before it's disturbed and then once yeah, yeah. and then you, you record that you think you take all these morphometrics you measure all the stuff you get parcel length and everything else and then you uh you euthanize it you use different chemicals for different uh classes or different types of uh, animals and it's all under an ethical guideline that we all agree to 
and then putting them generally preserve it in ethanol without formalin because it wrecks the it's harder to get DNA out of it and you, and you capture DNA too. And then you go back, you work with the university that you partnered with and or the R university and then you sequence, you you compare against everything, every every congener, make sure that it's that it is unique and where it places in the phylog phylogenetic tree, and then you, you just publish on that. And there's just kind of a rubric you do when you're do, doing the species descriptions. Um, and it's like there's nothing novel about that. Every time you kind of go through the same thing, uh, you record the call for frogs and you compare that call between like everything close to it and make sure that you know, this is a single note, this one has three notes, that kind of thing. Um, so that's you do, do a lot of actual science after you had the fun expedition and it takes months to get that done and go through the review process. The review process has taken much longer now than it used to. And, so, and then what about what about the naming of the species? So naming, yeah, that's always the thing. It's a faux pas to name it after yourself. I can't, you can. <laughs> I can go out there and find something to name it. Bro, my, my, uh, my goal, one of my goals in life, my many silly goals, is to have a genus of, of lizard named Tregosaurus, just because it sounds cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can have a bee named it too. It'd be a little different. But anyhow, so you can't do that. And you have to have somebody name it in your honor, if that's the thing. It's called an ethnonym. And it's kind of frowned upon because it's like you, there's, a lot of taxonomists or this pure breed that want to describe it based on location or uh, like something descriptive about the animal, which makes sense. Like, right. And that you pick it up and it's like, oh, it has a white band, so it's it's called Albocinctus, or whatever. And like, okay, that that's deserving. And sometimes you get like Zagorum, Baron Zagorum is named after George Zug, and it's um, Zug. We're well, actually not too sure. I think it's Zug. George, answer me. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so there's you name it and he. Like in Bangladesh, we had a new species of frog and it was another one of these things, you know, I found a roadside. I found two new species roadside in Bangladesh and wow. it, uh, you just have to know what you're looking for there for sure. Like I was very into what it was and my species are different as soon as I go, like the other thing kind of lost its feet down from my forth. But, uh, and then we, and it took about two years to discover that thing to go get more specimens, et cetera. Uh, but we named it Swanbornorum after the Swanborn family because they, they gave us $10,000 to name it after them. And that's a contentious thing for conservation from being a practical side of things. I, I think it makes a whole lot of sense. Like, cause we use that $10,000 to fund conservation work. It's not going to somebody's bank account and it's, uh, but it says nothing about the species and it's like this privilege that people can buy. Um, so people have different opinions on it. A lot of times they go for auction, you know, and so they can have, uh, Rainforest Trust does this a lot. And sometimes you get some businesses that go like the first one auctioned off, I think went to the casino. And they named it after a good casino. It's like, okay, well, that kind of hurts. Like, it's, yeah. it's capitalism <laughs> getting into, I'm not totally anti capitalism, but it's just like business really is naming it just for advertisement. It's kind of happen. So, yeah, the, the, the people who are very pure hippie at my at, at, at their heart is are probably just cringing at the thought of that yeah, <laughs> at a sure. species being discovered by or you know renamed after a casino. But at the same time, like you said, that's if that's one way to filter in money into these projects, then you know, maybe it's not the end, it's, you know, it's not the end of the world. Unfortunately, that's where we're at. Like, we need money in any ethical way that we can get it. And that's, there's no real ethical dilemma there. Yeah, it's, it's like a social thing, but it's not doing any harm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So how, how many species have you discovered, new, like new species have you discovered with, within the biodiversity group? It's over 30. And wow. that, that was before my time, too. Uh, and it's, sometimes it's hard because you, you can discover something you think you discover it, and then so many times it's discovering two months before you, but then we don't kind of advertise this stuff right away because you don't want to get scooped. And then so you, sometimes we'll come out six months later, you thought you had a new thing, and, and then it ends, up, it ends up being something you just call undescribed because somebody else has basically got their hands on it, but it hasn't been described yet formally. Um, so it's really right. like, so like I've, I've discovered new species of flower and tarantula and stuff like that, though then I didn't describe them either. So there's this kind of gray area, um, and I'm not. I, I don't have the proficiency to describe a new flower, you know, it's somebody else's specific thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. You need probably some training to be able to describe it accurately. Just pink flower. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you know, one of the things that I think if you live in a city or, you know, you're someone that's not in the, the rainforest, the jungle all the time, there, there is this image that we all have of the rainforest being chopped down and being bulldozed and it, which is happening and it is being, you know, chopped down to, to a small former self of what it used to be. But at the same time, it sort of 
removes the idea of how vast the rainforest actually is and how much space there is. So I'm not saying it's good that the, you know, we want the rainforest to be vast, but I think sometimes because we're constantly hearing about it being chopped down, people don't realize how much space there is. So from your point of view, do you think there's just a ton of things like very interesting animals out there that we have not even begun to see yet? So that's a really, a guess. I mean, there are obviously, especially deep ocean kind of stuff. Um, in the Andes is a huge hotspot for, cause you have all this very local endemicism. Like if you have this one mountain top, it gets a, an inch less rain a year and has fog at this different time of during the day, it has a different species of orchid, in it, you know, and something, and there's going to be a different species of fly or, or moth or something that's going to be pollinated. So that's, you get some really interesting stuff going on in the Andes with all this hyper localized stuff. But, um, so I don't, I don't know if we really want to get super into like these, the published extinction rates and things because there's a, it's a broad range. Sometimes they, they say we're missing, losing like a thousand species a day. And it's you know, like this, these astronomical numbers. And it really depends on how you sit as a lumper or splitter. And it's never played out that we're actually losing that much. Uh, even like, you know, recorded extinctions, there was, was it, was it like 18 last year? And so it's, like that's a, a horrible number. Like eighteen of these beautiful things that deserve to live are never going to be allowed to live again. Like and just from the just blatant disregard for life that humans have sometimes. And mm-hmm. so that's what we're really trying to protect. Like it, we we aren't doing the science and saying like how many species are going extinct and trying to. Uh, we, we're we're just trying to protect what we know is there necessarily, and and we know like Zagorum is there still. We have very good data to say it's there. And so we're going to go up there and make sure that it truly doesn't go extinct. Um, so we're really kind of focused on that one habitat at, at a time, or else you kind of get lost in this overwhelming, like, yeah, we're losing the Amazon at an incredible rate, and that's probably causing local extinctions. Um, but it's, it's like you can only focus on so much. Yeah, you can get overwhelmed really easy. And uh, yeah, we, we definitely don't want any more of it chopped down. Like you said, even 18 is a, is a huge number that is, is not ideal, but it, but there is still this incredible parts of the world that are totally untouched, which for me is like an imaginative person. It's just fascinating to think about, you know, going to the depths of somewhere that nobody has ever been, who knows what's, what's there. I mean, probably a lot of it's just like different beetles, but (laughs) you know, there's, there's, who knows? I mean, it's amazing that you've just within the biodiversity group, you guys have actually been able to discover 30 new species. That's, that's really amazing. Yeah, that's and that's just mostly reptiles and amphibians. So you, you, talk, right. you bring out, you know, some hymenopterists that study bees and like you can get tons more stuff, or a malacologist studying snails, like stuff that isn't really studied that much, and there's not that many people that are working on them. That's when you really get like a, a lot of new things. You can have somebody going out. We had some uh, expert uh, orchid experts come out, and they're finding news. So they just come out. They come back every day and like, okay, this is probably new, and I and they give it to me to photograph because I'm. A photographer too. I'm like sweet, like this. I'm the second person to ever see this, and I get to photograph it. And it's this huge privilege. And he gets his that's so cool. Beauty that's like just, and it, they're incredible. Like they have all these amazing adaptations and like these things that mimic fungus and like these specialized uh, structures and stuff. And this, you, what you get under a macro uh, macro lens, and it's just, it's just amazed. Even me and I'm a, I got a buddy of mine that runs a reserve down a different reserve in Ecuador. I got this uh, like five x uh, macro lens. And we literally were just, we were just drinking one night and at, at my table with the light and we were just looking at bugs and we're just like so fascinated, like two veteran biologists that like, we're just like, Oh my God, what is that? Like, what is that? Oh my God, look at this one. Like yeah. you know, it depends, especially when you look close, there's just some really incredible stuff that you're just like not appreciating otherwise. Yeah, I started to see a lot more of that sort of macro photography, especially with insects. You see, I see it on Instagram all the time and yeah, it does. It's incredible. The the structure and the shapes and just the morphology of these animals that you just cannot pick up with your, with your eye. It's, it's amazing. But then furthermore, like the cool thing for me is you, we find this thing, right? We find, we found a, a frog or a snake and it hasn't seen well. That's super exciting. We, it gets everybody jazzed. But then you don't know anything about it. Like you might be able to get stomach content, you know, and like use morph metrics. You kind of know where it was, but it's a snapshot. I love going out there and just watching this animal because then they have amazing behaviors. It's like a beautiful thing that does this beautiful thing. And that's really something that it's a golden age of discovery right now, like a re golden age. Like we had this Victorian era, everyone went out and collected everything, right? And then we described a lot of different species. 
and that kind of wa- they kind of waned for a while. And now that we got access, like I said, kind of we're fragmented, fragmenting forests, and now we're getting deeper access to stuff. We're able to get into places we hadn't been able to before, and be able to stay there longer, and be able to look closer. And so we're being able to do, extract all these new species that we had, that were just being ignored before. Is like in Bangladesh, like. I work in pangolins too, and everybody thought it was Indian pangolin for a long time. There was Chinese. Like you can just go there, and just is, if you look close in, in a lot of places, then you just and you you have a more just dis, like a discerning eye. Like there is so much to still discover there. It won't last forever. Like where there's because it's a golden age. It's like everyone's going out with with that idea in mind and just enjoying it. Like while it lasts, just they're just able to finally go into these areas and find all this cool stuff. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good segue into uh, this project that we're excited to talk about. I- is it Zugs or Zugs Monitor? I want to say Zugs. Uh, we, we're Zugs. in the consensus it's Zugs, but then it's I think it's German, so I think it would be Zugs if it's pronounced that way. But it's so we're going to go with Zugs. Well, yeah, we'll go with Zugs. So, so tell me how you first became familiar with this story. Yeah, so it's through uh, Global Wildlife Conservation, which is now uh, we need Rewild, uh, which me and I would be happy to do a ton of money to. It's kind of his. Is winning, I guess. And they had this lost 25 species campaign and uh, they had involved, it, it was widespread. It had, uh, you know, a duck in Myanmar and all this other stuff. And they had Zug's monitor. And obviously I'm a herpetologist, so then that caught my eye. I knew Robin Moore, who I don't, some people here might know him. He, he wrote a book, I think it's called like In Search of Lost Frogs, maybe. Um, but he's a really prolific photographer too, really amazing dude. And I knew him through the International League of Conservation Photographers. And uh, so I got in contact with him. He was managing that program with Global Wildlife Conservation. I sent a grant application in. We got money from Global Wildlife Conservation. And, uh, so, and then that was, that expedition was actually supposed to go out, uh, March 2020. Talk about bad timing. Mm. And so, like, literally, I think we were supposed to leave three, two or three days after, like, the U.S. kind of, like, really officially was like, okay, this is a pandemic. Like, we, we, this is going to be real. And I was kind of keen on going out and getting stuck in Indonesia for six to 12 months and just being like, all right, well, let's figure like if that's going to be a story. Um, but my, my girlfriend, she hadn't traveled that much. And so I was like, right, that's a lot to put on her, like, you know, crisis situation. So we canceled it or uh, we postponed it. And, um, and then life happens for everybody in the pandemic and things changed. Things kept getting postponed. And now here we are, 2023, uh, finally like really revving back this. Uh, expedition back up uh, in, um, with some other expeditions too. And luckily we got in contact with uh, Hardshell Labs, who I had known the founder and their uh, head of research from previous jobs. And they do a lot of conservation tech development and they were looking for a platform to deploy some stuff and for to basically they want to have some more purpose in what they're doing too. They were having a lot of uh, use cases in agricultural fields and power lines and stuff like that to get uh, the bread and butter of money to fund something that really fuels their passion. And so here I am with a bunch of programs around the world. And so we developed some new technology for this program. And, uh, and so that's where this eDNA drone capture program uh, system came into play. And it's literally a drone that goes up into the canopy and sucks DNA out of the air. And if, if the blizzard has been there within a certain number of days, we can actually detect it. But it's, it's even cooler because we're, they had, they had contact with Conservation X Labs and they had this new handheld barcode reader from a Mambit. And so I had, this is the kind of thing I got in trouble with Bangladesh for, like I had a nanopore sequencer I was training people on. And, and I, you can sequence it like right then and there with a minimal preparation. So we have, we can suck the DNA out of the air with a drone and then we can put it into this barcode reader and it kind of just tells us yes or no. And so now it's like having a, a bloodhound with you that's sent it on to this animal that you eat flies and goes into the canopy. <laughs> um, so, so basically it just sequences it and it's not giving you, it's not spitting out a sequence. It's basically just comparing to what you're looking for because you have the, the actual sequence in, in the machine or, you know, it, it knows what it's looking for and it'll just give you a binary. Yes. No. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah, that's incredible. It's super useful because you go out in these places, you don't know necessarily where it is. And if you get out there and you get a positive and say, okay, it has been here within a couple of days. We're not, we're not moving. We're staying here. Like it's it's here. And we know that's like the biggest data point you can get, and you kind of know like it was in the canopy or wherever, like mid level, ground level, wherever it is. So that's uh, going to be a huge, hopefully a huge game changer. We're still staying true because a lot of times you see these programs and they get all this fancy new tech, 
system would fail because they like kind of really relied on new tech. So we're still staying true to traditional methodologies that we've used in the past that have been successful doing traps and things like that and just doing what, how I know how to look for monitor to do. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so let's get people a little background on this story. This this was a, a species that was originally, I think it was discovered in the 80s, right? But it was misidentified maybe until the early 2000s. Is that right? Right. So it was collected in 1980 from Halmahera. And then, uh, what is his name? Uh, Wolfgang Bohm went into, he's a German herpetologist. And he went into the Smithsonian where that holotype is, the, the first collected specimen. And he recognized it was different. Otherwise, it was in case it was just like they thought it was his tree monitor. And uh, so then him and Thomas Diegler and uh, Andrew Andreas Schmitz, I think his name is, and they described it in 2005 or six. Um, so then it, then it became something new. Then they can track down, okay, well, and actually in the 90s, there was uh, a book published in Japan that had a photo of, of a Zugs monitor, and it was in the trade. And so it, we know that's another data point, but it was collected in the 90s still. So it, it was alive until that point, at least. And then if you go really deep into it and go through some back channels, you can find out that it's still in the trade. And uh, so it's just extremely rare, even for, tra- for the trappers to find. So it's this thing we, we honestly, like, it could be on the verge of extinction and it's still getting collected. So we're we're really worried about that. So that's why there's an urgency here to go out and that, okay, well, we need to know what the population is, where it is, so we can actually protect it. Would it be being collected, as, as far as the trade, do you mean for pe- people to keep them, or is there some other, like, food or skin or something? Uh, so the skin is a thing for other species of, of reptile, but not for this one. It, it goes, this, the live specimen go for a lot more, because the keepers want something that is unique and something to talk about, right, or something that they can just appreciate, but it's, uh, it's very expensive, and if you can find it, and it's illegal, very illegal and it's also harmful because uh, it could be harmful there's a problem high probability that it is so it's really irresponsible to take this thing right now you know if we find it and it find, turns out there's a lot of them okay like then it, it being in the pet trades could be a good thing you know you guys have to breed it you do you do well you treat well and then you don't have to collect anymore out of the wild that's great but first we need to know how many there are and how is it actually friendly or not is there any way to connect with, I'm sure the, 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 the type of people that are poaching out of the rainforest to add to their own pet collection is probably not the type of person that's going to collaborate with a biologist that's looking to see if they're extinct or not. But have you guys tried going down that avenue at all to just sort of see if you can find the, the supply chain for any of them that do end up in the pet trade? Right. So there's a little disconnect. So the collectors themselves generally don't go out and find these things and go deep in the jungle because it takes a long time and it's difficult. You have to get local access. You Right, permits and things sometimes uh, they'd much rather just you know pay for it um, and like leave it to the guys who know what they're doing that to collect it so there's this whole chain where you get somebody local that gets paid 40 bucks to go collect this you know ten thousand dollar animal he doesn't know it's worth ten thousand he goes and collects and he's happy with his 40. that guy is literally just a dude that has no idea what he's doing is potentially wrong and he's just feeding his family that guy's usually just a simple dude. And then you have these middlemen that actually the traffic it from the trader to then the international market or to go out of the, out of the island and stuff. And then you have the people that market it to the public side of things. Every step along that line is, is a different person, a different organization sometimes. And so if I was to try to contact somebody who's selling it, actually selling it, he might be able to get me the name of the trader that or the trapper that got it or something. But really, ultimately, I want to talk to the trapper. I want to talk to a guy that's out there doing the work. Um, it's important to know like how many are getting exporting things. You're not going to get that data to like, like because it's illegal and underground, they're not going to talk to you about it. Like I, I get whispers of things, but it's, uh, nothing actionable. Like, and I, I'm not looking to get anybody in trouble. Really. I'm just going out there and trying to discern, like, we need to know if this thing is an extinct or not or uh, on the verge of extinction. So we will go out and we'll talk to trappers. Other people have, we've talked to those people. So we have some good intel on where it is, uh, and how they get it. And which is cool because like when I was doing the research, like ex situ, I'm just you know looking to animal itself. Every everything that we know is published that I've heard. I, I created this thesis and and it turned out I found out to be, it's it's right. Like I, I, I was right on the money, knowing thinking what, where this thing was at, where it was, how it was acting, and everything else. I won't go into too many specifics because like it's it's kind of like confidential because I don't want people to go off and be able to 
find this thing right away. But um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, but, but some people get really mad at the poacher. The poacher itself is really likely the most innocent person in this whole scheme, but he's the one who gets caught the most and gets the most like negative press. But it's really the trade groups that need to be regulated. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, we've talked about this a lot on the podcast and that that's so true. I'm always very careful to make sure that we're not um, looking down on the people that are actually doing the collection because exactly like you said, they're just trying to feed their family. We, we did an episode back in, about hermit crabs and there's tons of wild hermit crab collection in, in Indonesia that happens and, and it's not people that hate hermit crabs or trying to get rich off of, you know, pulling hermit crabs off the beach. It's just people that are trying to, you know, get paid five or six bucks a day to collect hundreds of hermit crabs. And the same thing with lots of, you know, venomous snakes and whatnot, 12 year old kids running up a tree to grab a mamba just in order to make that, you know, 20 or $30 bill. And it's kind of, it's sad. And it's something that I hate about the reptile trade. And it's something that I absolutely always speak out about because I think it's, it's pointless to be using animals like that and it's disrespectful for them and so i hope that you guys can find them them and and you know you come up with a a population number or you know an estimation and maybe we can kind of start to slow down the illegal side to things how much do you know about the original collection is 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 that pretty well documented as far as where it was and you know what type of ecological niche and whatnot yeah, it was, it was near this, this city in our town in Amahara. And it was actually near where this uh, mega Chile Pluto, the giant wall, walls of giant bee, which was another uh, species that was rediscovered there recently. And it was also in the pet trade. And uh, Clay Bolt had rediscovered it, uh, another friend of mine. And he's, he's doing some work down the scenes now. And since they know that it's alive, they, they got a list on traffic, uh, which is like a, uh, a trade monitoring organization. And they have some, uh, they have some abilities to say, okay, well, it's now you can't sell it on eBay. You can't sell, you know, international markets kind of stuff on Facebook. So that's a big step forward. So then there's, you can, you can actually act on that. Uh, so same thing with, uh, in, probably just to say that it's found in the same area as this other one, but that's all we know, really. We know, and we don't have some, some stomach content analysis that it need a kind of backless for and a mabuya and like a uh, skink and, so that's basically all we know about this animal. You can look and see about its characteristics as a, as a monitor and it has mixed characteristics of both like arboreal and, and ground dwelling ones. And so it's like kind of this cool mystery of what, like, what is this thing really doing? It's, it's unique. Yeah. Yeah. And cause when I, now I'm trying to remember what it looked like, but it doesn't look like a tree monitor exactly. You know, the tree monitors are very long, very long, lean heads and uh, long necks and whatnot. And it sort of looked definitely in between. So it was, it was almost kind of surprising that it was miss identified originally considering how different it does look from a spit like from an actual tree monitor yeah that that happens like sometimes there's a lot these, these collections and sometimes back in the day they would come back with thousands of specimens and then you, there's something just gets overlooked by somebody who is tired or simply didn't know or something so they're he, literally that uh bone the guy went out and discovered it. he literally he discovered new species in the smithsonian he didn't go out and you know I've done it on Flickr. Yeah. I've yeah. on Flickr before, like online. So you can actually, you don't have to go into the forest to find something new necessarily. It's got to know what you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So uh, tell me about the expedition plans. Like you talked about some technology, the technology you're, you're going to use. And I kind of want to get back into that as well, just to sort of flesh that out a little bit. But so what is the plan? Cause you, you also said that you would use some more traditional methods. So obviously you're going to go to Helmahara and then what, what happens next? Yeah, so we, we go out and we're, we'll have our team and we have to go through and get all the, the bright permits and everything else and the right security clearances and stuff. And then we can go out and, and start looking for this thing. And it's, uh, tree monitors are hard because they, they'll see you well before you see them. And so they'll be on the backside of a tree and you won't see them. And this is dense jungle. Luckily, there's not, um, I was actually fairly concerned that there was going to be death adders on the island, which there, they are in OB and stuff there. Cause it's in this awesome area where it's that Australasian kind of, uh, mixing and so you get some asian influence you get some australian influence and um and there wasn't a whole lot of data to say what was there and what's not so uh, but it turns out this forest is rather um it's safe so that's nice so we can just kind of chomp around and we have areas you know go on google earth you know what we're looking for we find some spots hire people to go out beforehand cut trails for us because it just saves time and then we can go out and have base camps and we can go out and and scatter from there and do like thorough studies. So, and we can start collecting the DNA and we'll start doing like ass assessments on the habitat and everything else and see if uh, we can find any. We set up our traps, the different kind of traps, and we're actually doing some kind of uh, 
we're making these traditional traps more uh, uh, contemporary. So we were adding like electronics to it. To t- we bring a bunch of them out and we're climbing trees and putting stuff in there. And we don't want to be climbing those trees every day. Like I'm going to be doing this. It's exhausting. And so we want to be able to throw it up there once and then have it like tell our phone, okay, well, yeah, you got something to trap 22. And then we can go and see, maybe it's false positive, but you, then you, you can climb that one tree to 22. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And how long do you, is there a, is there a timeline for how long you would plan to stay there or is it open-ended? Uh, no, so you, yeah, you have to have a timeline. It's going to be four weeks in the field. I'll spend two more additional weeks after there and we'll likely leave some stuff in the field. There's a, there's an issue though. Like we're, we want to leave like traps up and camera traps and things like that to see if we don't find it. And uh, so there's, cause we're going to be in the right areas, have everything set up, but then because it's in pet trade and because there's like, there's more money to involved in taking that from us. And we might just be assisting, you know, poachers, uh, the trade by keeping these things up and they're going to tell us like, Oh no, we didn't find anything, but then they have to come through and then they want to pet trade. So we don't want to facilitate that. Right. So that's actually something we're trying to figure out right now. Yeah, that is fascinating. So, that, so then let's talk kind of getting back to that eDNA. This is a, it's, it's a contraption, I guess, connected to a drone. Is it, had like a little vacuum on it and it has a little little pouch for to collect air like how, how does this work and and like the first thing that comes to my mind is how much dna are animals leaving as they're is it just like you know s- cells that are coming off their body or how does that work edna in general like it, it's used a lot of times in aqueous environments and, and streams and stuff we'll go and we'll you, you have like a pump and a fil- set of filters and you can uh, basically it depends on you have different size micron filters and they have three filters and stuff like that. So you'll build a dunk in there and then, and then you have the right filter size for, to collect DNA. And then you take that and then you can, you can extract the DNA from there. Same thing for the air. It's just, you just getting, you need less, um, you, you need less pre filter, but then also, uh, you need to suck in a lot of air because it's less dense than water. And so there's going to be less DNA per unit area. And, but so like in, in terms of sloughing off, cells and stuff we all have an exome so it's like the what we ex like outside and owns like just everything like genome kind of thing so when you walk around you walk by somebody you smell them right? or you can and you sometimes you can smell people from like five feet away that's you smelling it and that's like your nose isn't that great so we have this cloud around us that we're always emitting like microbes and, and fungi all kinds of stuff but also skin cells and that's what a dog like a you know a bloodhound will go and you just leave every time you, you walk it just sloughs off and, and they'll be able to smell that for days after you go somewhere and it just stays we're just not able to detect it innately so that's what we're doing with this this contraption we can basically say it's like the stuff when you look in the in a forest like it's so humid a lot of times that you can just see all this particulate just like all this water vapor just just floating right and it's just it's dense and it stays up in the air so a lot of time we're hoping that for a lot of species, I think mammals probably slough off more than, than um, reptiles do. And, but you can even detect invertebrates, which, you know, have an, this exoskeleton that you wouldn't think sloughs off much, but you can still detect them via air collection and DNA. This isn't the first time that we've been, that this process is going to happen. It's the first time that we're going to be able to go out, collect eDNA and then sequence it right away and be like, yes or no. And so that's the novel part of it. And usually you don't put it on a drone and throw it up in the, in the canopy. And select. So that's kind of novel as well. But Yeah, because I imagine I'm, that's got to be so disappointing if you go out and you do all this collection, then you got to go all the way back to the lab and back to your home country, then throw it through. And it's just like, no, you just actually have air in there. So it's, it's, it's so much faster to be constantly doing that. So did you guys have to build some sort of contraption to, to connect this to a drone? Exactly. And that's, that's hard shell labs. That's what they're, the beauty of having. Oh, that's what they do. Okay. Yeah, so they get to do that. And like, I can have ideas for like what kind of things to, to make. And I can query my network of conservationists. Like, okay, what technology do you need to make your life easier? And they're like, oh, well, I thought of this one time. And like, okay, we can make that. Sure. And then we get this, like, they got some genius that makes this stuff and, um, it really works out. And will they, they operate and pilot the drone as well? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so it's Ryan Borman is the guy. Uh, Bill Borman is their hard shells uh, director of research, I guess. And uh, Ryan Borman's his, his son. Uh, I think he's around thirty, but uh, he's he's a whiz at this genetics, and uh, and so he's the one that really he got the connection with Conservation X Labs, and he's doing the eDNA research. So that wasn't that, that wasn't my program. That's something I'm supporting, and something it's a, I'm giving him a platform to deploy it. And, but he's going to be operating that drone and, and really he's the brainchild of that, that whole drone based eDNA collection. 
Yeah, it's it's really fascinating. And then I guess for what it connect, collects, if it, if it doesn't collect the, uh, DNA from the monitor itself, there's nothing you can do with the rest of the DNA in that in that parcel. I'm sure, or or or, or can you? Is there, are you able to sequence it and figure out what that is, or no? That's just too much. We would definitely try to we'd, we'd hold that DNA. We wouldn't we wouldn't use okay. all of that material. And so you can at a later point you can say, okay, well now there's this bird that we want to find. Can somebody else can then use this this filtered uh, air and see if it and you can hold you can keep that in mind so you can freeze it for a long time and stay valid. That is amazing. Okay, that's cool. And then I also wanted to talk about. I think that was one of the things that Noah had mentioned was the 3D scanner or basically the, the ability to to not have to euthanize the animal in the field. So, can, and you know, you already mentioned that typically you find something, you have to euthanize it. Unfortunately, that's just the way we've been doing it for hundreds of years. But can you talk about how potentially we have a step out of that? Yeah, so this, this is my jam. This is something I came up with a couple of years back. And while I was, you know, sitting on one of these consulting jobs, which is the beauty of it, I can just sit there and be weird and think about weird stuff. And like, okay, I can do this. It's going to piss off a lot of taxonomists because they, they always want to collect everything. But I think there's a real use case for this. And so I eventually got a contact that, you know, this guy gets consulted for Lucas Films and like all these big companies, productions. And he's a whiz at it. He, so I, I was chatting with him. I knew his wife. And so I was chatting with him then. And he designed, I got a partnership with one of his really, one of the biggest camera um, uh, brands in, in the world. And we chatted them up and they were like, okay, this, this is legit. We'll support this. And they gave us, uh, they agreed to give us the, the cameras and everything else that we needed. And then this guy started designing it, made this contraption where it's not field tested yet. I'm taking it down to Panama and in about a month or a few days now. And, and we're field testing it to make sure that it's all going to work out, but it should. And uh, after that, it's going to change everything. Like, so with, for 400 years since Linnaeus, we've just been, euthanizing things as soon as we find them and that was fine back then but when we have all this critically endangered stuff that we need to record and get information about then we can we can now go out and i can find this thing and it's like well, we, we haven't seen it forever we don't know if it's the last one and so we go out and we find it we can put it on this contraption and we can take a 3d scanner and assemble it and i can throw it out into the cloud this guy can assemble it and we can deposit it as a digital specimen from the field we don't have to kill anything we don't have to leave the field just there. And then we can actually do all that. Everybody in the world, kids in classrooms around the world can just see that instantly. They put the VR goggles on, they can like make it money, whatever. And any scientist can use it immediately. They can see it. They don't have to travel to Indonesia. They don't have to have that sense to the Smithsonian. So to like as a, inter, um, as a loan or anything like that. So there's a lot of benefits to this. And then after we scan it, it's not invasive. We take the DNA sample from it. We can do, we can do, we can extract that tank gun. That content if we wanted to. We we're, were planning on strapping these transmitters on there, this new type of telemetry device that we can put on them, and then we can just monitor what the, we should learn what they're doing, their ecology, what they're, where they're behaving, like, like, what, like what part of the canopy they're spending most of the time on, what, what kind of trees are they using, that kind of stuff. And instead of just putting and uh, having it sit in a jar somewhere, like we learn all this other, other data by re- releasing it and then and having being able to share it everywhere. Until we understand that, okay, I mean, there's a there's a solid population here. Maybe we want to take a couple of specimens to because we don't we can't do CT scans on the stuff and know about the bone, bone morphology and stuff like that. Um, but for now, it's great because we can just take this thing out in a 20 liter backpack, which is the first time that's the, really what's novel about it is the size. We can do like in the Matrix, they kind of did this. You know, I have that 360 kind of filming and then just like pause it and then just flip. It's kind of like that. Yes, and and then we can just pause that take that moment in time from all angles and then and, and then we don't have to take any more that is incredible I, I can't imagine how much it will unlock as far as just like you're saying you know how much more research we can do by tagging them and releasing them back and also even just you know we've been talking about discovering or rediscovering species this whole conversation that would be so much easier you know someone goes into the field they scan something it goes to the cloud and then somebody might go no that's actually a new species you just found something new can, can you can you sort of verbally describe what this contraption looks like? Like hey, you said, it fits in a backpack. How how does it, what, what does it look like? And how, how would you actually get a wild monitor to go through this, you know, yeah. to sit on this thing? Is there some like, you know, putting them to sleep or how does that work? There are tons of tricks. Like, you know, you know how to make uh, a water monitor, like any big monitor, just kind of relax. Uh, some uh, as a girl in Singapore taught me, actually, you just scratch their back like, really hard. Like with your nails. Interesting. And then it's, it's basically like if they if two water monitors are clashing at it and they're going at it themselves. And then at the end, a lot of times they'll just like go at the other guy's back 
And then that's just telling them to be submissive and be like, okay, I'm done. And so you can really, well, it's, it's the same thing as putting a lizard like upside down, you know, and, and putting his chin up and it's just kind of just like, okay, I'll do this. So there's way, there's a lot of different ways of manipulating these animals in a way that's not harmful to them. And you learn that doing macro photography a lot, because if I want the snake to stay still and I want this perfect pose or whatever, I want this foot out on this lizard, you have to know like, okay, well, I got to touch his tail in a certain way. I got to like move it, yeah, some, yeah. Put this color in front of it. I got to do whatever it is. So that's fun for me as like, you kind of learn about the biology and what's the behavior. But uh, so when you find it, we put it on this, this platform and then this platform has a rig around it that we can have all these cameras that are simultaneously taking a photo and then it, it just does it all. We can do it all once, and then it we can collect the image from each of those cameras, and then stitch it all together and get the text the files and all that stuff. It has lights. That is it. amazing. That's incredible. I mean, it's amazing that you thought of that too. I, I'm, I'm, I, it's crazy that we've gone this far, and no, and it's not that's something that has not been implemented before. You know, it seems like a, kind of an obvious thing. It, well, it was conceptually obvious, but there was never until recently there was no commercially available hardware to do this, and now there is. So. This is something that is, it's because before you'd have to have a bunch of DSLRs, right? And you, and those things are heavy, but when I carry them in the field and that you have a whole backpack just for, you know, one camera body and, and there are the lenses and stuff. So with this, if you have these really small cameras and you can go out and, and put them all together in a certain way and, and, and now it's like, it just reduces the, the form factor by 10 X. And so you can actually carry the stuff out there. How small are the cameras themselves? It's like GoPro size. So it's like a bunch of GoPros in this like circle and they just snap. Kind of, yeah. Yep. Damn, that's so cool. Pretty exciting. So yeah, we're, we're stoked to do it because the other aspect of this too is you, you've seen photos of specimens that have been preserved in ethanol for like 50 years, right? They're like they, they lack color, they're kind of bland, they're, sometimes they weren't really posed that well and things. Now you have in perpetuity, you preserve all that color you know, in all sides and like you, you, you know how it's standing, you know, like all this other stuff and um, so it can capture all that. So there's a lot of benefits to it. It's not going to like take out the need for euthanizing things like in general, but it's going to make it so that when we find something super rare, then we have an option not to euthanize it. Yeah. Well, and, and like you said, the, when, once you've euthanized it, you lost all the opportunity to learn about its behavior, which is probably the most important thing that we need before, you know, when trying to figure out numbers or population or how, how they live, how they breed. You can't do that after you've euthanized it. How do you extract stomach contents? Is that another, is that just a, like a physical thing to, to push on them or, or what's the method there? Yeah, it depends. Like snakes, you can kind of just slowly push that food up the bolus, but then sometimes you can like flush it out too. You put a tube in there and just put some water and then it, sh- it shuts, it shoots the stomach content out. Um, or you can dissect it if you want to do that way. Right. Yeah. Um, so there's, it depends on your situation, but it's, it's valuable information because you know, like, okay, is this thing eating birds mostly? Is it eating lizards mostly? Is it like, what, what's the behavior of these things that it's eating? And is it, um, and it, so you, you can start getting a picture of what, how everything interacts with each other. What, what about size? How, how large is the, this monitor? Is it, it's not maybe like three feet maybe, or we have no clue? No clue. Yeah. The, the, the whole, the holotype, the initial specimen, it's a juvenile, very small. So okay. we can kind of indicate like if it's similar to the other monitors, yeah, it, it could have like a two foot body kind of thing, but, um, we won't know until we get out there. Yeah. Damn, that, this is super exciting. I really do hope you guys do find it. And the, the sort of the additional layer of strangeness and excitement about this project is the association with Robert Downing Jr. Can you talk about that and how that connection came and what that means for this project? Yeah, so his foundation did this amazing thing where, uh, so we, we launched on experiment.com is for the, to fund the EDA aspect of this. We have some other funding due to the core uh, expedition costs and we need a couple, we need a couple thousand extra dollars for some other things. But for this, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a springboard for people. And he's, he's like, okay, well, he wants to fund bleeding edge science kind of. And so his foundation comes and said, okay, well, we're going to give you, you know, $6,000 if you can fully fund this, uh, this program. And we're like, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll take this opportunity. And it's, it's a, those are the kind of like matching funds make it a lot easier to fundraise for people because they, they know something's coming. So they know it's like there, it, it, builds momentum for everybody and so that was uh, props to you robert downey jr thank you for supporting our program um i hope you yeah it's amazing how, how much money are you guys looking to raise and then is he, so it was it was it the six thousand you guys were going to raise six thousand he was going to match six thousand or 
Yeah, essentially, it's what it's coming down to. That we so we need ten thousand five hundred dollars for to fund this uh, EDNA thing. We right now we have seven thousand like three hundred or so. Uh, so we we need about three thousand more dollars, and that's it, which is incredible. To uh, and we have about thirty days left on the campaign, so there's time to do this. And even like small donations, like ten dollars, it, it helps helps keep building momentum. Like that. and that number keeps going up every day. People know that helps keeps other people donating. And so if we can get that money, then it's an all or nothing thing. So if we don't wrap, if we don't reach that 10,500, then we lose everything. Um, and we just won't do this. And we, this technology won't come into play. And that's really a shame because, you know, even more so than the, uh, the 3D scanner, which is going to be revolutionary, this eDNA, like in terms of searching for new species and, and things that are extinct or, or things that are just rare that, you know, it's probably here, but you want to get population size. Having this eDNA sniffer like is is supremely valuable, and it saves people time. It makes you actually more effective in the field. So that that will change nearly any expedition coming after us that's searching for something. They, if it works, then everyone's going to adopt it. So that thing really needs to get funded. And if it's only we're we're like seventy percent there, so we just need that little push. If you do hit the goal, where do you know when you would actually go on this expedition, or is that still open ended? Yeah, no, it's September. The, the timeline's all oh, September. Uh, so we'll, okay. Yeah, sometime in September for about four weeks. Well, that, I, I, I am now talking to the listeners. This is something, you know, we that, you know, that listen to this podcast consider ourselves that responsible herpetoculturists. So we're, we're focused on doing things ethically and morally. And this is an example where we can take people from who participate in the good side of the pet trade to help defend the the animals in the wild and making sure that it's not us that are actually yanking them for the wild for no reason because we're associated with reptile keepers. It's, it is reptile keepers that are doing that. And if we can be a force for good, this is such a perfect opportunity, not to mention the cascading effects of positive things that will happen if this expedition moves forward, like you're saying, the eDNA, the 3D scanner and whatnot. So this is such a great opportunity. And that's why I really wanted to have you on to have have, you know, the listeners are going to be excited by this. I know the people listening to this are going to donate as well. And like you said, you get a bunch of people donating $10, we're going to hit that $10,000 goal in no time. Well, think of an investment too, in terms of the horticulture trade. You're not going to get one of these until we find it and it's regular. You know, you're not paying, mm-hmm. unless you got $20,000 in, in the right context, you're not finding this thing that you're not getting it. And then you still have huge risk, right? But also, you also want, I think most of you guys would want other people to be able to enjoy this, not just you with your twenty thousand dollars. So, if you give me ten thousand dollars to find or ten ten dollars to find this thing, think of it as investment, because then that is enabling you to eventually have it at some point in the future, where we can regulate the trade and get it into the legal pet trade, have the right people breeding it, and then having it eventually get down to you. So, if you want this thing in captivity, this is a way to be able to support that. Yeah. Yeah. There's just really no reason not to do it because it is such a positive thing and, and it's the type of stuff that we want to be supporting. So can, can you let everybody know what, how they can support? I'll make sure the links are everything in, in the show notes as well, but just verbally, where, where would people go to, to help out? Right. So you can go to that experiment.com fundraising page and just type in Zugs Monitor. You can go to our website, biodiversitygroup.org and, and go through there. It's on the front page. Um, or you can just don't, you can donate through the biodiversity group donation page too. It all goes to the same place. Um, so th- those are the really big places you can donate on Facebook. You can, there's a, we have a ton of ways to do it. You can donate, um, cryptocurrencies. You can donate your old field gear. You can, if you have cameras or anything like uh, GPS units, boots, anything like if you, if you're not using it, we can find a place to, to make use of it. Uh, like I said, we have a biodiversity library, which we give out uh, access to on the fair, fair use clauses that if there's like a researcher in Indonesia that needs to a chapter out of this book, but you know, it's a $150 book. He doesn't have it. We can just send him that chapter. And so we have a massive library that we do this for scientists and nonprofits around the world, which is super helpful. And uh, so basically any way that you want to support conservation, you can go through biodiversity group and we can, uh, we can, we can help you get that done. Yeah, that's amazing. And listeners are very familiar with me promoting conservation. And I always say that's one, as a reptile keeper, you need to support conservation in some way. You know, one of the things that this podcast does is we donate to a rainforest conservation, but there's so many ways that people can help out. And this is such an important one. And I, I think as an to, to close that ethical loop by keeping animals in captivity and doing a good job caring for them, you still need to support conservation in some way to make sure we're not acting or, you know, 
participating in the poaching and, and, you know, taking up from the wild. So this is a, you know, serving up on a platter, so many great different reasons to, to help this out. So is there anything else, Scott, that we left out that you wanted to mention before we wrap up? Yeah. Yeah. I kind of want to talk about a little bit, you know, sometimes there's this dichotomy where we think that the conservationists are against the hobbyists and the hobbyists are against conservationists. So I love what you're doing here because we're not against the hobbyists. Like we, we are very much in favor of things being captive bred. If that means that it's not going to be taken out of the wild, but we want to do so in an ethical way. We want to do so in a responsible way. And so if you, we want to support you. If you want to get involved with conservation, like you have an ally within the biodiversity group, we can work together. And I, and again, just congrats for having this great podcast and getting, making this link happen. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I do, I completely agree. There's, there's always this kind of butting heads between the, the keepers and the conservationists or the conservationists. And, and it, it really not, should not be that way. We're all animal lovers. We're fascinated by these, these creatures. And as long as we're all doing things ethically and in, in the morally correct way, I think it will end up helping the animals as a whole. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's what everybody appreciate. Cause I got into this field doing having animals too, you know, in jars and in banks. And, and that's the only way to really build that appreciation. So I'm, um, I don't hold, I don't cap, uh, I don't keep anything anymore because I travel too much, but I, I appreciate how, how fun it is to have this stuff. This stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great point. Can you, you, you already mentioned the website and whatnot. I think, can you mention the Instagram and any other social media that people can find you on? Yeah. So just check out biodiversity group on basically on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on, uh, we'll be getting more on TikTok soon. Um, so that's, those are the main channels and we try to post some cool top content. We get some comedians on there to, to actually write some fun stuff. It's, and the documentary, we'll have a documentary coming out about this trip. Uh, and hopefully it's going to be a little, it's not going to be like your typical documentary where it's, you know, that, 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 that same, same thing you see in every documentary, the same playbook. We're going to, we're going to make it a little fun and creative. So, cause that's kind of how the biodiversity group rolls and just a little bit different. Awesome. Okay. Well, that's great. I cannot wait to see that again. Uh, I'm wishing you all the luck to hopefully hit this 10,000. I'm sure you will. You've already hit, you know, 70% of the way there, like you said, and I'm very excited for this project and I can't wait for all this. So Scott, thank you so much for coming on, sharing the story, getting, doing the work that we all, you know, so many of us, uh, the listeners will be wishing we were doing as well, but we need people like you on the planet to be doing this type of work. So thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for doing your work and we will have to follow you up, follow up with you in, in a couple of months to see how things are going. Yeah, and if you guys want to join us on an expedition, we, we have an offer in a little while, but I used to run them in Bangladesh and we used to run them in Ecuador. We're going to start them up again. So just shoot me, shoot a message to the website and we'll put you on a list and we can, we can go out and find some new stuff. Awesome. Okay, well, there you go. All right, well, Scott, thank you so much. All right, cheers. All right, that is the end of that episode. Scott, thank you so much for jumping on the podcast and telling your story and, and laying out how this amazing expedition is going to look and work. I just, I am so excited for this and I have a lot of faith in the reptile keeping community. I'm speaking to the reptile keepers now. We have an opportunity to help push this towards that $10,000 threshold. Again, I am not looking for people to make giant donations, but I think this is one of those moments where we can say the reptile keepers were able to make this thing happen or at least help this happen. And that's the stories we want to start generating. We don't want to be talking about the poachers that are pulling animals needlessly out of the wild because that happens. And we talked about it in this episode. We want to be the force that fights against that and this is a perfect opportunity to do that and i do hope that is i i will personally make a donation myself of course and i hope that many of you are able to make a donation again whether it's five dollars or ten dollars or fifty dollars or wherever you're comfortable where, wherever that that threshold of you know coffee money type thing if you have something that you can give i think this is such a good opportunity to do that and just imagine the type of stuff that's going to happen afterwards if this does go through you know we talked about the implications of the 3d scanner and the edna sampling and, and whatnot and and i'm very excited for it and if they do find the zooks monitor then you can actually Actually say I helped fund the project that rediscovered an animal that hasn't been seen in 40 years and I think that in itself is, is, is an incredible story and I think we can make this happen so let's make sure that that, that they get the donations they need and we'll, we'll have our fingers crossed that they get the samples and they're able to actually find one of these animals because that will be absolutely fascinating if you're looking for the donation links and everything else you can find that at the show notes at animals at home network.com it's also in the YouTube description as well Thank you so much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring this podcast. If you're looking for any po- or any reptile 
equi equipment and closures and whatnot. You can find that at the affiliate links in both the YouTube description and the show notes. Again, as I said at the top of the show, a deep appreciation and a deep thank you to the patrons who are helping support the show and really help produce the show. Without the funding that I get from Patreon, this show would no longer exist. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. If you are, if you found this episode fascinating or as fascinating as I, as I did, please share it. Again, this is one that we want to be shared far and wide. We want people listening to the show. We want people to be motivated and eager to donate $20, $30, whatever it is, because we want this project to go. So please share this as much as you can. If you aren't able to donate financially, sharing this video is the best thing you can do because that will get this show, this, the show on more ears and eyes and that will help hit that threshold of $10,000 and hopefully a Zoog's monitor at the end. That would be absolutely fantastic. And if uh, either way, I would love to have Scott back on to discuss the project once they, they do wrap up at the, I'm sure at the end of next year type or at the, at the end of this year. All right. I think that's the end for this one. I cannot wait to continue sharing these incredible episodes I have. There's, there's, I'm actually recording another one later today. So super excited about that. And I will catch you guys in the next episode.